In the tapestry of time, a story unfolds of a faithful God whose love is forever endless. Through the lowest valleys and the highest mountains, his steadfast presence is always with us. In every trial and every test we face, he holds us close in his unchanging love. When shadows of doubt gather around us, his faithfulness shines as a brilliant sunrise. With arms stretched out, he guides our way, a beacon of hope in the darkest day. In every moment, his promises hold true. He paints the sky with hues of dawn, reminding us that we're never alone. Through every season, in joy or strife, God's faithfulness is the anchor of life. So let us trust in his unwavering hand as we journey through this shifting land. For in his love, we find our peace. He is always and forever faithful. Hey guys, if you guys have your Bibles, if you would turn them to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Um, if you don't have your Bibles, you can use your app on your phones or whatever. Uh, but 1 Corinthians chapter 16. My youth pastor, Pastor Chuck Gorley, he would always say this. He said, a belief not practiced is not a belief at all. A belief not practiced is not a belief at all. He'd read that to us before youth group, just about every youth service. And I just want you guys to think about that as I go throughout my intro. Um, the title for, for, for tonight's sermon is Genuine Christianity. I want to challenge you guys as a youth to be genuine in the midst of a hypocritical culture. Um, think with me about this question. Have you ever met someone or interacted with someone that seems genuine? They seem genuine on the outside, but really they aren't. You hear them talking behind their back, your back or whatever it is. Um, but maybe on the other hand, you've met someone that they might not seem genuine at first, but they really are. During my junior, junior year of college, actually it was my sophomore year, because my junior year I roomed with Chris, I was taking this class, it was called Evangelism and Discipleship, and me and three other guys decided based off of this class, it was teaching us to witness, teaching us to disciple people, so we wanted to go out into our local area, and we wanted to be a witness. So Chris was one of those guys, there were two other guys, their names were Max and Lauren, and Chris, Max, Lauren, and I decided on Sunday afternoons, we were going to go out into our local area and we were going to uh, door knock but instead of like UTNs on Saturdays uh, that come you, you guys uh, pass out flyers so we would actually have conversation try to um, win someone over to the gospel and just give the good news to them and uh, ask them if they'd like to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and uh, we, we went out usually Chris and Lauren would go out as a duo and uh, Max and I would go and knock on doors. Max and I came up to the store and a lady was exiting the door. Her name was Elaine. And so we met her. She was on her way to work. She was uh, jumping in her car. So uh, on, on the way uh, to her car, we kind of walked with her to talk. She said, you can walk with me. And uh, we figured out that we were both believers. So both Elaine and us were believers. Her husband, Joy, Jory, was there as well. And uh, so we got to meet them. And they said, come back next week. We'd love to talk to you guys. Uh, next week we came back and their house, uh, it, it was burnt to the ground. So it was, there was still smoke coming up from it. Uh, we come back the next week, Sunday afternoon, and they were standing outside their house. So we talked to them, hey, can I pray for you? Can we do anything for you? Like I didn't have a lot of money. I was a college student, I was broke, but is there anything that we can do for you? I went to campus church, talked to them, our college church, and, and, and asked them if they'd be able to do anything for them. Uh, just stayed in contact with them. They said, Elaine and Jory said that because of what, what had happened and they were trying to find lodging, they were having to work all day Sunday, so they weren't able to go to church at all. So they asked us if we'd be willing to do a Bible study with them. We had a discipleship book that I had just gotten, and uh, they asked us to do that. So once a week, Max and I would meet with Elaine and Jory at this coffee shop called Drowsy Poet. It was about a 15-minute walk away from the college. So... Uh, I was sitting in class. I, my time management back then, my wife's taught me a lot, but my time management back then was terrible. I didn't really put anything in my calendar, uh, so I didn't have these appointments uh, at the coffee shop on my calendar. I was sitting in Greek class. I had just finished a quiz. Chris or Trevor or both, I don't know, maybe neither of them. We had two sections. Might have been in the class when this happened. Um, but I was sitting in Greek class, just finished a quiz, and Max texted me. He said, Caleb, we're supposed to meet with Elaine and Jory in 20 minutes. Are you ready to walk over to Drowsy Poet? And I'm thinking, well, I still have 30 minutes more of class. I don't know how I'm going to be able to make it. Uh, and so I was just thinking to myself, like, would I rather take the absence and take the late penalty and, and leave class and uphold my commitment? Or would I rather uh, just stay here and totally enjoy it? I can't make it this time, just have Max do it. 
And so I was thinking, and I was like, no, I want to keep my word to Elaine and Jory. I want to go. And uh, so you, you guys know there are teachers that are really good at awkward situations. Like if a guy's clowning off, I did that in high school a lot. Like if a guy's clowning off in, in, in uh, your class, they're really good. They'll say a joke back or something and get them to shut, to shut up or whatever the kid's doing. And they'll, they'll, they'll be able to handle it very well. And then there's teachers that are just not good at all at handling those awkward situations. Uh, um, this teacher might have been on the latter side of that. And so I was thinking, I don't know how I'm going to do this, because I wasn't able to tell him ahead of time, like, hey, I'm going to head out, so this is going to look really awkward for me. But I put my backpack on. I'm in the front of the classroom, so I'm like up here sitting. And uh, the door is like here. They're only in the back to exit. So I'm, I'm sitting here in the front, and I've got to put my backpack on. I've got to walk all the way back here. So I start walking back, and I hear my teacher go, Caleb, really? Really, Caleb? And, and I'm like, what am I supposed to do now? Like, now, now it looks bad. So I was going to, I was right at the door. I was about to, I was like, I might just jet it. Like, I might just jet it out the door. But no, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to try to explain uh, what, why I'm, like, about to leave his class in the middle of right after our quiz. And so I turned to apologize. I was super nervous. One of my friends, Daniel Kamara, he's an awesome guy. He was sitting in the back. He's from Africa. A great dude. And uh, he's laughing, like I'm high-fiving people on the way out. I don't know why, they just were like, dude, you're leaving Greek class, that's awesome. And um, my friend Daniel Kamara is sitting in the back, and he just, he's laughing, he's looking at me, clapping, I don't know why. And then he, he gives me the peace sign. So I turn around, I forget, I'm so nervous, I forget everything I'm doing. So I just, I give him the peace sign back, and then I, and then I walk out the door. And I mean, to my teacher and everyone else in the class, that looked pretty, pretty terrible. Um, <laughs> Everybody thought I was like just super being disrespectful, and I mean, I would have thought if I had seen that I was being disrespectful. But in reality, I just was super nervous. I was trying to meet this couple to do a Bible study with them. I, I apologized to him afterwards, and he said, "Okay, so I think we're good now." And um, but uh, I was able to meet with Elaine and Joy. That though I didn't seem very genuine in front of my class that day, God does want us to appear genuine in our Christian walk. Um, and God wants you to choose to be a genuine Christian. I'm going to read our passage now, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to look in verses 13 and 14. So verse 13 and 14. It says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. Let's go ahead and pray. Our Father, as I come before you, God, just thank you so much for this group of teens, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity you've given me to speak to them. I pray that they wouldn't hear me, but they would hear your word, God, and that you would help me to communicate clearly, that you would give me the words to say. Um, I love you, Lord. Thank you for loving me first. You know, pray. Amen. So, um, tonight, how can we choose to be a genuine Christian? Um, here are three actions we can take to choose to be a genuine Christian. Choose to lead. Choose to lead. This is an action we can take. Choose to lead. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 says, um, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. So here we just see that it's telling, it's telling men, quit you like men. It's telling Christians, the believer, it's telling them to lead. Step up and lead. The first way that I see that we can lead is to choose to lead in our service like Christ. Choose to lead in our service like Christ. Mark 10 Verse 42 through 45 says, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered, ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So how can we lead others in our service? Well, we see here that Christ wants us to be the chief servant. First, I see that we can recognize the needs of those around us. How do we lead others in our service like Christ? Recognize the needs of those around you. And guys, this is so important. Um, the needs of those around you could be as small as they have a busy day at work or as big as they had a friend that just passed away. Um, the, the, their need could be as small as like if you want to or you see a group of of adults or teens or whatever coming to the door and I saw Lily you chose to open the door for them and I'm very thankful for that but that's a sacrifice that's her time she doesn't have to be doing that no one has to hold open a door but that's a sacrifice and recognize the needs of those around you uh, my wife and I uh, this was before we were engaged I think I think we were dating at the time we went to this amusement park in Alabama so we lived in Pensacola and we went to an amusement park in Alabama called Owa Amusement Park so we went and we um, it was a big amusement park. She loves them. I hate them. I hate roller coasters. I hate all that. Uh, 
Yeah, anyway, um, I went on all the rides with her, even when I almost threw up on, and she said it was bad too. I'm just saying, I'm a man. And uh, <laughs> so I went on all these rides, except for the biggest roller coaster. But anyway, on the way out of this amu amusement park, we went to a McDonald's because we were broke college students, and that's what I could afford. And so we went to this McDonald's, and God, God put it on my heart, the Holy Spirit put it on my heart, Caleb, I want you, I had a track in my wallet, I want you to give a track to the lady that brings you your food. So at first she brought us her food, I was like, God, I don't know if I really want to, okay, fine, I will. Went and gave her a track while she was at the counter, and she said, I've been looking for something like this, I was just diagnosed last week with terminal cancer. I'm like, I didn't, I, didn't, I don't even know this lady, like, I'm from Pensacola, she's in Alabama, I, I had no idea that she had just been diagnosed with terminal cancer, but she had been looking and thinking about after I die what happens. And so if, if God hadn't convicted me of that and I hadn't gone to her, I wouldn't have been able to recognize the need of those around you. Sometimes that takes actually going to a person, um, and it, even a person you might not even know. Uh, recognize the needs of those around you. That's how you lead others in your service. Another way is to represent a Christ-like servant. So that means taking the time to listen. I know uh, I'm, I'm an introvert, so talking drains me, but um, I do like to talk, so it's kind of a lose-lose situation. And when, when I talk, I, I, I don't know, I like to talk a lot, but God gave us two ears, one, my, one mouth. Many times in Scripture, it urges us to listen, and that's something I constantly need to learn, something I'm working on in my marriage. I need to listen more. So how to represent a Christ-like servant? Take time to listen. Not only take time to listen, but also take time to pray for those around you. Go up to someone and ask them, hey, how can I pray for you? Um, and then pray, actually pray for them. And a way that you can show them that you actually prayed for them is following up with them. So for instance, I could, I could so easily, I could go to Trevor, Trevor, how can I pray for you? He says, he says a prayer request to me, and I say, okay, I'll be praying for that. And in reality, I could just, I could never pray for it. I could, it could be out of a heart of like genuineness, like I just forgot, or it could be just like I got busy and, and I, I just didn't get to it. But um, a way that you can let people know you truly care and choose to lead in your service like Christ is go up to them and be like, okay, hey, I prayed for that. Hey, I prayed for peace. How's that going? How's your walk? Do you feel peace? Hey, I prayed for your homework. Were you able to get that in? Whatever it is, um, we can really uh, be a blessing to each other if we create an environment of prayer. So choose to lead in your service like Christ. Um, by recognizing the needs of those around you and representing a Christ-like servant. Not only should we choose to lead in our service, but you should also choose to lead in your submission like the centurion. Choose to lead in your submission like the centurion. Matthew 8, verse 8 through 10 says, The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to, to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come. And he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, not in Israel. Here, the centurion, he's able to tell a hundred men under him, any one of them, hey, go do that, and they would go do it. And he, he would tell them, hey, come bring me that, and they would, they would bring him that. He could tell them, do this, and they would do it. Why? Why would a hundred men just do whatever one man tells them to do? The, the centurion recognized, I wouldn't be able to do any of that if I wasn't under Rome. The Roman government gave the centurion the system and the authority he needed to be able to tell his men what to do. And something that was really, I'm telling you, really hard for me, and I never really truly learned it as a teenager, was to choose to submit to authority. Because the centurion realized, without Rome, if I didn't submit to my, my boss, the centurion says, then I can't tell these men what to do. And he realized that Jesus was able to do all the things he said. He was God, but he came under the authority of God. And that's why he was able to do all of those things. And he believed that because Jesus came under the authority of God, Jesus had the power to heal his servant. And something that, that even I, I'm thinking Chris, Trevor, and I, if, if we want to, Trevor and Chris have done a lot here. They, cha they changed the lights earlier. They put up the posters. I mean, all this wasn't here before. They, they put together the couch. And if... if if you guys want, like Trevor, Chris, and I, if we want to, to do things like this for this building, then we have to place ourselves under the authority of Pastor Matt, of Coach, of the different members of the staff here, of Pastor Michael. Because if we didn't place ourselves under their authority, then I don't have the money to get all this stuff. I know Trevor doesn't have the money to get all this stuff. So, but if we didn't place ourselves under the authority of, of our boss, then we wouldn't be able 
to accomplish anything like that. And the centurion recognized this, and I want to encourage you guys, recognize who will always be your authority. Recognize who will always be your authority. You might think right now, well, I'm tired of this teacher. I don't want to submit to this teacher. Or I don't want to submit to my parents. I can't wait till I'm 18. I get to grow, grow up and get out of the house. I, I had those thoughts. And, and right here, we see that even when you're out from under your parents, you're still going to have an authority. You're still going to have someone that you've got to submit to, and that authority is God. And the centurion recognized this. God's sovereign. He's over everything. So recognize that you're always going to have an authority and respond by stewarding the authority that you have under him. Respond by submitting to your parents, submitting to your teachers. Steward the authority that God's given you. If you do that, you can do so much more for the work of Christ. Um, be responsible. Give the gospel to people around you. Draw attention to God. Glorify him. Be an example of a genuine Christian youth. Not only should we choose to lead in our submission, but we should also choose to lead in our shamelessness like Paul. Choose to lead in our shamelessness like Paul. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. How many of you have ever been embarrassed? Raise a hand. You've just like had an embarrassing moment. Like every time your parents get over to your house, get someone over to your house, they're like, oh, let me tell you this story about Joanna or about whoever. Like my parents tell me that all the time. Like they'll get someone over, they'll tell the same jokes, they'll tell the same video, show the same videos, tell the same stories, and it gets old sometimes. But I've had many embarrassing moments in my life. I just told you guys about one earlier at the beginning. I'm going to tell you guys about another one. My junior year of high school, I ran cross country. And God gave me the opportunity to compete at regionals and state that year. We had won our district meet, so we were advancing to regionals. And I had been training all summer. I had run 450 miles during the summer just to, to train into the season. And uh, so God gave me the opportunity to be varsity. So I was like, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm about to be able to run the regionals meet for the first time. And I'm going, uh, we had to wake up at like 4.30 because the races were at 7. It's ridiculously early. And uh, our bus gets there. It's super dark can't see outside and I'm just following the guy in front of me and I see him step over something but I was like there's nothing there I don't know why I thought that but I, I was tired it was early in the morning and um, I trip over a parking block hit my knee it swells up um, we didn't know what was wrong with it but they didn't want me to run on a swollen knee uh, plus I wasn't the, like anywhere near the best runner on the team so coach was like we'll just have the alternate run and then you can if we make it to state you can run at state and so I was I, I cried I was so sad um, I was just there to cheer on the team. I took an Advil, it didn't go down. I was like, no. Uh, but it did heal, and the next week I, I was able to run at state. But that was another just, my, my team never, they never like got over it. They, they just kept teasing me about it the next season. They were like, hey, Caleb, uh, we are at regionals again. And they were like, hey, Caleb, watch for the parking blocks and stuff. Like, okay. Uh, but anyway, um, so what I, what I want to encourage you guys with, back to bringing it, bringing it back in, is choose to lead in your shamelessness like Paul. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So um, here, I want to encourage you guys, don't be embarrassed to talk about God with believers. Don't be embarrassed to talk about God with believers, with each other. It should not be hard for you guys to go up to each other and say, hey, how can I pray for you for? Hey, how, do you need anything? Hey, what have you been reading in God's word lately? You want, like, um, hey, this is something I've been reading. I just thought it would be an encouragement to you. That should not be hard with believers. And if it is, then I would encourage you guys to change the culture of the youth group. If it's not, then keep the culture that you have now. Um, don't be embarrassed to talk about God with other believers. Also, don't be embarrassed to talk about God and share the gospel with unbelievers. I know that that's scary at times. I told you guys about how uh, Chris Thorne, Max, and I went out. I don't know, if he, he probably has a lot of stories himself, but one time Max and I went up to a door, saw a guy a bit wearing a Baby Yoda shirt. I was like, perfect, I'm gonna start talking about the Mandalorian transition into the gospel. I mean, what a transition. And so I was like, hey, start talking about the Mandalorian. The moment I mentioned, uh, hey, um, if, you, if you stood before God in heaven, would you know that for sure that you're going to heaven? I just wanna, I just care about you. I want to I share the gospel with you. And the moment I mentioned that, he just started cursing Max and I out. Started, almost set his dog on us. But what I'm trying to say is that was scary. But don't be ashamed. Don't, don't be embarrassed to go and tell the, tell the gospel to those in your community. Don't be embarrassed to talk about God um, in, with unbelievers. So in order to choose to be a genuine Christian, we must choose to lead. 
we must choose to lead. Okay, I forgot I had this. Uh, it, one of my friends, that's not a famous person, this is my friend, um, he, he said this. He said, a famous person's probably said it though. Alexander Buckley, he said, it only takes a small group to make a big difference. It only takes a small group to make a big difference. And I'm gonna show you guys a quick video. I'll probably skip it because it's kind of embarrassing, but um, my, my friend and I, so Chris, Chris was a junior class officer, and um, the junior class officers, when I was a junior in college, they put together a big party for us. Chris put together a whole playlist, like there are a bunch of songs. The song that's playing right now is like a Hawaiian song. I don't even know what it is. Maybe you guys recognize it. Um, but me and five friends, five friends and I decided we are going to start a movement here at the junior class party and so we all put our hands on each other's shoulders and we started making a train and like follow the leader we're like going around to the, mu to the music and in about two minutes uh, uh, hundreds of juniors were just going around the gym just I don't know um, they all did it so what I'm trying to say is a small group can make a big difference and uh, yeah that happened so choose to lead and your choose to lead, and your service like Christ, and your submission like the centurion, and um, also choose to lead, um, and your shamelessness like Paul. Not only should we choose to lead, but we also we've got to choose to love. So I gave you guys an action leading. I gave you a, a application that you guys would be able to use to lead, and any one of you can do this. You don't have to be in the pulpit to be able to do what I just talked about. I'm, I'm now going to talk about choosing to love. Now this is, a, this is an ambition. I don't know if you guys know what that means, but that means, because I, I don't, don't, if I just didn't look up the word, but it means motivation. Um, it means motivation. So while you're leading, what are you motivated by? And 1 Corinthians 16, 14 talks about this. It says, let all of your things be done with charity. Let all of your things be done with charity. How can we choose to be motivated by love? First, I see 1 John 4.19 says, We love him because he first loved us. Be motivated by love because Christ loved you first. All the actions I mentioned earlier, going, talking about God with each other, praying for each other, talking about God in your local community, whether it's holding the door open for someone, helping someone when they drop their books, pick them up, whatever act of service you're doing, whatever act of leadership you're doing, you can choose to be motivated by love. This motivation always works. So, for instance, if... If Kyle dropped, I don't know, a basketball, and I'm like, I'm going to go pick it up for him. And I, so I, I go pick up the basketball for him. I could genuinely think, and it sounds silly, but it, it's a small thing, but it's important. I could genuinely think, because Christ showed me love, I'm going to sacrifice my time, pick up Kyle's basketball, give it back to him. And because Christ showed me love, I want to show him Christ's love. That will work, and I'm telling you, I've, I've tried it in my own life. That will work for every single decision you make, because it, every single right decision you make. Because if, if, if God loved me and I want to show his love to others, that can motivate everything you do. So be motivated by love because Christ loved you first. Christ sent his son to a cross. He became a man and he died for you. And because of that, we can be motivated by that love he showed for us and, and show that love to others. Also, be, be motivated by love because Christ commands it. So be motivated by love because Christ loved you first. Also be, be motivated by love because Christ commands it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17 says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So here we, here we see Christ commands us to love the brotherhood. So if, if nothing else, we, we've got to be an example um, of love to each other as believers. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is obviously like you guys are mature enough. It's agape love. It's Christ-like love. The, Christ that, the love that Christ showed for us when he sacrificed for us, we can be sacrificing for each other. Um, be motivated by love because Christ commands it. And finally, be motivated by love because Christ supplies it. Be, mo be motivated by love because Christ supplies it. Matthew 22 says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So this was a struggle for me because I, I, at times I overthink things. And uh, when I first started dating Lupita, I was thinking uh, in my mind, I don't know why I was over-spiritualizing it, but I was like, God, I, I don't understand how I can love you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and still love Lupita, my wife. I don't, I don't know how I'm able to do both. Because if I'm loving God with everything, how do I have any love left over for another person? And this verse cleared it up for me. Um, 
what, it, what it's saying when, when it says the second is like unto it, if you love God, if you guys love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, if you fear God, if you make him your everything, if, you, if, you're, doing, if you're walking with God, reading God's word, praying for others, praying for, uh, praying for yourself, for growing, and you're living a victorious Christian walk, and you love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, then love for your neighbor is just going to happen naturally because it's a fruit of the Spirit. Love is a fruit of the Spirit. But if you love God with everything, if I love God with everything, I'm automatically going to be loving Lupita. If I don't, then there's going to be moments when selfishness pops up, when whatever, and, and I am not. That doesn't just show I'm not loving her the way I should, but ultimately, I wouldn't be loving God the way that I'm supposed to. Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. First one there is love. Those applications we talked about earlier, such as praying with someone, opening the door for someone, they, they've got to always be motivated. They should always be motivated by um, the ambition of Christ's love. In order to choose to be a genuine Christian, first, guys, I want to test you guys. All right, I, don't, I almost never do this. get too nervous, but what was my first point? If we want to be a genuine Christian, we've got to choose to what? Lead. Lead. You guys are awesome. All right, so our second, my second point, if we want to be a genuine Christian, we've got to choose to what? Okay. Our, fa- our, our, our last point, sorry, is going to be we've got to choose to look up. And this is an attitude. This is an attitude. We've got to choose to look up. If you go back to verse 13 in 1 Corinthians 16, it says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. So here it's saying, watch ye. That, that term was referring to like a guardman. It would, it would tell him, you need to choose to be tirelessly vigilant. Choose to be tirelessly vigilant. Um, we all know that we have an adversary, the devil, that walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The devil does not want you. The devil wants a foothold in your life, and he doesn't want you to be a genuine Christian. The devil doesn't want you, but that's why we've got to be vigilant. Be vigilant for temptation. Be vigilant for false doctrine. Not only should we choose to be tirelessly vigilant, but you should also choose to be triumphantly transparent, especially with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, D.R. Harrison uh, that was an evangelist that I heard at a, a barn meeting. There was a, there's a rich couple in our community in Pensacola. They put on a barn meeting. It's so cool. They bring in a Christian band, and they bring in a, an evangelist, and they give the gospel, and they give a free steak dinner. So, like, hundreds of homeless people would just show up to this, this barn meeting. And I, I think every time I'm there, I've seen 10-plus I've seen people saved. And it's, just, it's once a month, such a work of God. Love to see it. But D.R. Harrison was the evangelist that I heard this particular night, and he said... Um, testimonies can be triumphant through transparency. Testimonies can be triumphant through transparency. Um, my, my teacher in marriage and family, Dr. Ennis, Dr. Ennis Anderson, he said, you may have a tainted past, but you can have a spotless future. So I, I want to encourage you guys, find good Christian friends you can trust. Find good Christian friends that you can trust. Whether it's here in this youth group, and if you genuinely can't, and you have other friends that you're like, I trust them more, and they're believers, and they love God, and they walk with Him, then go to them. But I, I'd encourage you guys, go to someone else in your youth group. Uh, find friends that, what I mean by that too, is find friends that won't gossip. If you're going to be transparent with someone, I know at least at first, all I cared about was that they didn't talk behind my back. So for, for your sake, at first, go to friends that you're like, I know they're not going to gossip about me. And be transparent with them. Be transparent about, with them about your struggles. Maybe, maybe it's, uh, I struggle being consistent in the Word of God and reading. I struggle praying for other people. I struggle with lust. I, tr- I struggle with anger. I struggle with greed. Whatever it is, be transparent with your friends about that. Find good Christian friends you can trust. And secondly, forge an accountability group. Galatians 6.2, one of my favorite verses. It says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear ye one another's burdens. So here it's saying, to make the bur- burden easier um, of the person next to you. The Christian life wasn't meant to be lived alone. Stop trying to bear the burden that you have today alone. Stop trying to fight sin on your own. And stop trying to live the Christian life on your own. So specific application I want to bring to you guys is just a question. How, how are your daily devotions? How, how, how often do you read God's Word? Do you even have a time set aside to read God's Word? Um, secondly, uh, how, how is the daily battle of renewing your mind? The devil constantly tries to get things to fill our mind. And many times those things could be sinful. Many times those things could not be sinful, but they are 
are, are little g gods. They are just what we put above God and we value above God and we spend time with more than God. So, so what are those? How's the daily battle of renewing your mind and praying for God to renew your mind and help you to walk in the spirit? Do, do you guys have accountability partners? Um, if not, for you guys, I'd love to talk to you if, if you guys feel like you can trust me. But um, uh, if, you, if you don't feel like that, go to a different leader here or go to another guy. And girls, you can go to um, a girl leader or, or each other. Um, do you have an accountability partner? Uh, Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And I want to I bring this to your attention too, um, is, which is the, one of the problems I mentioned was lust. And I know that that's a, that's a big problem today. And I want to bring this to your attention because it really uh, moved me when I heard it. Uh, this, this quote says, If the godliest man... The wisest man and the strongest man to ever live all failed in the area of lust. What makes you think that you can beat lust on your own? So guys, do you guys know who the godliest man in the Bible was? Anyone? His heart beat in line with God's besides Jesus. David. David. David was called the man after God's own heart. He failed in the areas of lust. You guys know? Anyone know? You guys can just shout it out. Who's the wisest man? Solomon. Solomon. Failed in the area of lust. Strongest man? Samson. Samson. Failed in the area of lust. So if... If I think that I'm godlier than David, wiser than Solomon, and stronger than Samson, then maybe I can beat lust on my own. But I don't think that I am, and I don't think that any of us here are. So I'd encourage you guys, it's really important to find an accountability partner. And I, and I want to emphasize, too, it's not just for this. It's for whatever you're struggling with. It could not be that. Um, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. In order to choose to be a genuine Christian, we must choose to look up. God wants you to choose to be a genuine Christian to do this. We must choose to lead, choose to love, and choose to look up. By God's grace, let's leave the past in the past and choose to be the genuine Christian that God has called us to be from this day on. Uh, and then I'm going to close with a quote from Pastor Gourley. A belief not practiced is not a belief at all. I'll go ahead and hand the mic over to Trevor after I pray. Our Father, as I come before you, God, I pray that you would help us to consider your